So I am Joey. I'm the worship pastor here at Dan River Church. Uh, if you, this is your first Sunday here, we'll see. Maybe it's awesome that you're here and it's great and you're going to love it. Maybe you're going to be like, I don't know about that guy. So either way, make sure you come back next week when Pastor Scott is here. All right, so you get the, you get the full, full deal there. All right, but I'm very excited that God has given me an opportunity to be able to speak this morning on something that's really near and dear to my heart, something that's very important to me, and that is worship. I'm always grateful that I have the opportunity to stand up here on Sunday morning and lead worship. It's something that I'm very passionate about. It's something that I love to do. But any time that I have a chance to preach, that just also, that kind of cranks my engine because I love the Word of God and being able to share the truth of God's Word. So today, let's dive into a familiar passage, and that is John chapter 4. Verses 19 through 26. Today I'm going to be reading through the, from the New Living Translation, but we also have it there in your worship program for you to read along, and it's also going to be up on our screens. I'll tell you what, I love fall. It's my favorite season of the year, but it wreaks havoc on my throat. Anybody else feel that? You're like, man, fall's great, but come on, can you, can you back up a little bit, fall, and get out of my throat? That'd be great. That'd be great. So hopefully you're there by now. John chapter 4. Verses 19 to 26, this is what it says. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshiped? Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, and indeed is now here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. This is a really cool story, and a lot of us are very familiar with some of the events that happens before then, but let's talk a little bit and get the, the, the backstory of this. All right, first of all, this takes place in an area called Samaria. All right, now Samaria, there's a map for you. If you're a geography nerd like me, you love maps. Samaria is this area here in the middle between Judea and Galilee. In the nation of Israel, there was really three different sections, Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. And so what would happen was, actually, there was a time in, Jews, in the Jews' history, in Israel's history, where they were taken off to captivity. During that time, some of them were left behind, and they actually intermarried and intermingled with the foreigners that moved into the land because the Jews were gone. And when they did that, they actually kind of mixed up their religion. So you have Judaism that's kind of mixed with this pagan religion. The Samaritans are those people. They are the people that intermarried and mixed up Judaism with another religion. So whenever the Jews were released from captivity, they came back. The temple is in Jerusalem, which is in Judea, there to the south, kind of near where that dot is at the bottom of the map. When they came back, the Jews kind of saw the Samaritans and what they were doing, the way they had mixed this religion, and they said, guys, you cannot come to our temple and worship. You cannot worship Yahweh here. And so the Samaritans were like, well, forget you then. And so then they went back to Samaria, and they built their own temple and their own places of worship. And so now you've got this big, long, like hundreds of years feud that is going on between the Jews and the Samaritans. Now, it was so bad that the many Jews would do whatever they could to avoid this area altogether. They would avoid Samaria altogether. So like if they had to go from Jerusalem in Judea in the south to Galilee, which is in the north, they might go all the way out of their way just to avoid Samaria. Now, to give you an idea of how crazy this is, it would be kind of like somebody that lives in Virginia going through Tennessee to get to Myrtle Beach just because they don't like North Carolina and they refuse to go through North Carolina. It's crazy. But that is how deep and heavy this feud was between the Samaritans and the Jews. So it's kind of odd that Jesus is there in the first place, but then the fact that he engages in a conversation with a Samaritan woman makes it even stranger. 
probably are familiar with this story. If you were like in Sunday school growing up, this lady, she comes to the well. Jesus is at the well. Jesus says, give me something to drink. She's like, what? Why are you talking to me? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. That's crazy. And he says, if you knew who he was talking to, you would ask me for the living water that I can give. And then he proceeds to tell her all of this stuff, this real private personal stuff in her life that nobody knows about. And he's like, just, hey, I know all this. I know all your dirty secrets. And she says, I perceive you are a prophet. That's where we pick up our story right here in verse 19. He says, I perceive you are a prophet. Now, that's kind of like an understatement, right? She's talking to Jesus, and she's like, oh, you're a prophet. Well, the natural conversation then ensues. That kind of happens whenever somebody thinks there's a prophet around or a pastor around, then like a spiritual conversation ensues. So she decides to ask Jesus a spiritual question. And so she asks her spiritual question. Well, you guys say we should worship in Jerusalem. We say we should worship up here. What's the deal? Jesus responds in a way that she did not expect, which I find to be very, very typical. Anybody that's walked with the Lord any amount of time, you will find that when you ask God for something, he very rarely responds in the way that you think he's going to respond. And this is the case with Jesus. He says to her, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when you will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while the Jews know all about him. For salvation comes from the Jews. That's not what she expected to hear. You guys don't know what you're talking about. You guys, don't. it doesn't even matter where you worship. That's not what she expected to hear. Now, let's be clear. What Jesus was saying here when he says that you guys don't know about God. See, the Samaritans, whenever they mixed their religion, they only actually recognized the first five books of the Old Testament. All right? The law. The Jews, they have all the Old Testament. So the Samaritans are missing out on the prophets. They're missing out on all the history. They're missing out on the Proverbs. They're missing out on Psalms and songs and all this other stuff. They don't have all of God's story. God has taken his words, put them in men, and they have pinned them into Scripture. God is revealing himself through Scripture. And the Samaritans didn't have it all. They literally did not know God because they didn't know about a lot of these promises like the Messiah. They were missing a lot of these things, the details that God was giving them. So when he says, you you guys don't know me, you guys don't know God, they literally don't know. Which brings us to our first point. Worship requires a recognition of, of the truth. Worship requires a recognition of the truth. We throw this word worship around kind of like we know what it means. If I say worship, everybody in here has something that pops into your mind, some kind of thought that pops into your mind. For a lot of people, maybe it's music, maybe it's something else, but we really think we know what it means, but do we really? The word that Jesus is using and that this woman is using here in the Scripture when they say worship, this is what it literally means. I've actually got the definition here. It says, to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand, to fawn or crouch, literally or figuratively, to lay down an homage in reverence to a door. To lick like a dog? That's worship? Now, did anybody read that and you're like, ew, weird, right? That's not the first thing that pops into our mind when we think about worship, but it really kind of makes sense. Who in here has a dog or you've ever had a dog? Okay, so I'm a dog lover, but I don't currently have a dog because we rent and we're not allowed to have a dog there. You know, that's cool. But growing up, I always had dogs. Courtney and I, when we lived in North Carolina, we had a dog. And actually, I got a picture of her here. There she is. Isn't she cute? My daughter, that's my little girl, Ashlyn, with her there. But this is Holly, Holly Berry. We got her at Christmas time, and so we felt like Holly Berry was the awesomest name ever for a little dog. And so we, we got Holly. Now, Holly was, you know, she was a dog. But I would come home sometimes after work, and I would reach down to pet her. And what would she do? She would lick my hand. Like, she wouldn't necessarily be like, oh, just rub me. She would reach up and respond by licking my hand. She was showing me affection and adoration whenever I got home. But now there may be times whenever she did something she wasn't supposed to do, 
and she got in trouble. There was probably a lot more of those times, all right, and she got in trouble. I get on to her, and she responds by putting her head down, tucking her tail, which she didn't really have much of a tail. It's kind of like a stub. She would tuck her tail and just lay down, showing me reverence and respect because I am the authority in her life. You know, when we think about that mindset, when we think about the relationship that we have, the master with the dog, it really makes perfect sense when we think about it that way with our relationship with God because it's a very accurate picture. We adore him, we show him affection, but we respect him and we honor him. So it's actually a really incredible picture for us to think about. But in order for true worship to occur, in order for my relationship with Holly to be what it was supposed to be, She had to remember who she was and who I was. I'm the master. She's the dog. In order for us to really have worship with God, we've got to recognize the truth, not only the truth about God, but the truth about ourselves. God has revealed himself to us through Scripture. What what are some of the things that he says about himself? Well, he says that he is the self-existent one. When he gives Moses his name, I am, he is literally saying, I am self-existent. Nobody else is responsible for me but me. He is the creator, Genesis 1.1. He is indiscriminately gracious, but he is ultimately and perfectly just. He is totally sovereign and in control of everything. God reveals all these truths about himself to us through Scripture. Man is none of these things. We are not self-existent. We are not the creators. We are definitely not just and gracious, and we certainly don't have it all in control. We are not totally sovereign. God is God, and we are not. We have to realize that truth. I believe a great picture of that truth comes from the book of Job. Now, if you know the story of Job, Job was a godly, godly man. And God allowed things to be taken from him, all of his blessings to be taken from him to try him. Job finds himself in a place where he's going, God, I feel pretty justified in asking you, why are you doing this to me? I'm I'm your guy. And all this stuff has happened. Why are you allowing this to happen? So Job does, and God responds. He spends two chapters not answering Job's question. Job says, why did this happen? God spends two chapters, instead of answering his question, telling him about himself. God's telling Job all about himself. Then he spends two more after that, just to make sure he got the point. And after God has revealed himself to Job, we see this beautiful, beautiful passage of Scripture in Job chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. It says, Then the Lord said to Job, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but do you have the answers? Then Job replied to the Lord, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. God never answered Job's question. He simply revealed himself to Job. And how did Job respond? With worship. We have to recognize the truth about God and about ourselves so that we can worship. So now that we have an understanding of this definition of worship, let's look at some of the misconceptions that surround worship. Look again at verse 20. We see that this lady, she's asking about the place. She's asking about the activities of worship. And then Jesus responds and he says, Believe me, it was, the time is coming will it not matter where you worship God on the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You skip down to verse 23, and Jesus tells her that you are to worship God in spirit and in truth. See, this woman is asking about the activities of worship, and Jesus is responding with the attitude of worship. That's our next point, is that worship is not about an action. It is about attitude. Worship is not about The action, it is about attitude. She's talking about the rituals, the traditions, the practices. They had the law. So she was familiar with all of these things that were set up in the law that were activities of worship. Ceremonial washing, doing sacrifices, 
all of these things that were associated with it. But Jesus is telling her, yeah, these, these practices are great, but it's the attitude beneath the practices that actually matters. And whenever God gave these laws and gave these commands, it was never about the action. It was always about the attitude. They would wash themselves because they want to show that they want to come before God clean and holy. They would sacrifice something valuable to them because they want to show God full surrender. The attitude of surrender creates sacrifice. The attitude of a clean heart creates the desire for ceremonial washing. The practices reflected the attitude that was already present. And that's what Jesus was trying to draw out of this woman and get her to realize Worship is not singing. It is not a genre of music. It's not a style. Worship is an attitude. Now, here I am, the worship pastor, the guy who leads you guys in songs every single week, telling you worship is not singing. You can worship by singing. But whenever I say, come on, let's stand together and worship this morning, I'm not saying, hey, you know, like, all of a sudden, start worshiping. It's your job. You do that. What I'm actually trying to do is to open the floor to you and say, hey, express to God through this song what it is that's fe- what you're feeling in your heart. I pray and I see God's face on the songs that we sing because my desire is for us to have songs that can put words in your mouth that spell out the attitude of your heart. The action follows the attitude. When you walk in the door with an attitude of worship, your natural response is going to be an action of worship, but that's not the source of it. There's a theologian, his name is A.W. Tozer, and he says this. This is a great quote from him. It says, worship is to feel in the heart and express in the appropriate manner a humbling but delightful sense of admiring awe. See, the action of worship follows the attitude that is there. And later on, A.W. Tozer says this. He says, we can admire without worshiping, but we cannot worship without admiring because worship is admiration carried to infinitude. In the same way, we can honor what we do not worship, but we cannot worship what we do not honor. So we're not just coming in here having a hoedown on Sunday morning. Let's sing together, y'all. Woo! All right. If you come in without an attitude of worship, like if you come in without the admiration and the awe of God and we sing these songs, that's literally what we've just done is had a hoedown. Sweet. We sang songs together. Yay. We could do that anywhere. Like we could do that for any reason. Happy birthday to you is not a worship song. All right? Unless you're singing it to Jesus on Christmas morning, which is kind of cool. But when we get together, we all sing happy birthday together. We all do it. We're corporately involved together, and we probably mean it because we like the person most of the time that we're singing happy birthday to. We come in on Sunday morning, and you just sing without this attitude underneath it. You're just singing happy birthday. It's the same thing. The action must follow the attitude. But now keep in mind, singing is not the only expression of worship that we have. We can pray and worship God. There are times when we can read Scripture and it be worship. There are times we can just stand there and listen, and it is an act of worship. Our tithes, our offerings, when we give those at the end of the service, you're going to have an opportunity to do that on your way out. You could do that as an act of worship. Your service, giving of your time, your gifts, your abilities can be an act of worship. Think about this. You have an opportunity to serve at the fall festival this week. That can be worship. You could be sitting there, like, helping a kid pick up rubber ducks, and it be an act of worship. Why? Because you have said, God, I love you. I'm so thankful for what you've done for me. I'm going to give you my time to be here, to be present, to help your ministry, to help your kingdom, to do this for you. That, guys, is worship. You could be sitting in the back nailing a ring toss game together and it be an act of worship because of the attitude that is underneath it. So always remember that worship is attitude, not action, and the action has to follow the attitude in order for for worship to really happen. Our next point is this. Worship engages the head and the heart. 
Worship engages the head and the heart. We jump back into our passage in verse 23. Jesus tells the woman that true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and that the Father is looking for people that will worship him that way, that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Throw these two words up here, spirit and truth. I want us to look at these two words, what they mean. I think it is not only the fact about a state of being. You know, we, we talk about kind of worshiping God in spirit because he is spirit and we have a spirit and we worship God in truth and in, in, in knowledge. But I think it's also actually about what part of you is actually engaging in the worship. Spirit that, that relates to our soul, it relates to our heart. It's the emotional connection that we have with God. Truth relates to our mind. You don't think with your heart, all right? I mean, how many times have you heard that kind of advice? People that they're in love and they make a really stupid decision and you're like, well, they're thinking with their heart. That's a bad idea. You think with your head, all right? But you can't love with your head. You love with your heart. You need both of them. We have to engage them both. When we think about our soul, connecting with God on that emotional level. I think we have some good examples of that in Scripture, one of which is Isaiah chapter 26, the first part of verse 9. It says this, My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. Yearns. That word, it invokes emotion. You don't yearn with your head. You're not sitting in science class studying chemistry and going, I yearn for that chemical. Right? You don't. You yearn with your heart. Man, you yearn for your wife, or at least you should. It is an emotional connection, an emotional attachment to God that is expressed through our spirit, through our heart. But at the same time, we have to engage our minds. If we come in and we just have an emotional worship experience, You just kind of like had a free-for-all, and it gets kind of crazy sometimes. Sometimes, maybe some of you have been in a a worship environment where that's kind of the case, where you feel like it is just like, whoa, we have let loose and we're out of control. Now, it's good. Throw your hands up. Shout to God. These These are things we have in Scripture. There are some times that you're going to move because you just got to. But at other times, you can tell things have kind of gotten out of hand. They got a little bit crazy. Why? Because it was an emotional attachment without the mind. We need the mind to engage. If we walk in and just emotionally attach to worship, we're missing half of the equation. How can you really, truly, emotionally attach to a God that you haven't with your mind recognized the truth about Him? When you know in your mind the greatness of God and what He has done for you, When you know your position and his, it creates an emotional response. But you have to engage them both. Now, if you come in and you just engage with your mind without the emotions, you're just going through the action. You're just kind of doing the practice because it's what you have to do. So you have to engage them both. Paul actually gives us a good example of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In verse 15, he says this, What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. The two parts, they've got to be working together, the mind and the spirit, the head and the heart. There's an old saying that many of us probably have heard before. I think it was attributed as like being like a Sioux Indian saying, but I can't find like an actual author. But this is what it says. The longest journey you will ever take is 14 inches, the distance from your brain to your heart. Now, I think that the original intent and desire behind this quotation is really kind of a one-way journey. It is when you take something from your knowledge, something that you know, into something that you believe. I'm sure we all struggle with that. There's things we know that are true, but yet we can't like take it down into our heart and really believe it as truth. But I believe that when it comes to worship, 
This is not a one-way journey. This is cyclical. It's a constant, never-ending, back and forth, head to heart, heart to head, head to heart, heart to head. Because you engage your mind and you realize the truth about God, it creates an emotional response in your heart that just, just pours out of you. And in the midst of that emotional response, I believe that if you're truly engaging your mind and your heart, that God reveals more truth about himself. We sing songs intentionally that are designed to be theologically sound and rich. There are songs you are singing, words coming across your lips in a worship song that is theology. And we're trying to teach you that and reveal more about God and his truth. We're singing scripture, the way God reveals himself to us. That creates a new thought, which creates a new emotional response. I believe that what worship does is it takes this long journey of 14 inches, this long one-way journey, and I believe it turns it into a busy superhighway that's just constantly got traffic on it. When we fully engage our heads and our heart, that is the way that we can really engage in true worship. So we see we recognize God's truth. We respond by an attitude of worship that creates an action in us because we have engaged our minds and our hearts. And the fourth thing that we see here is that worship is not about a place. It is about a presence. This woman was so caught up in the place of worship. If you look at, at, back at the passage in John 4, if you look at verses 25 and 26, she's asking Jesus, where, where are we going to worship? And Jesus responds, it's not about that place. And then she says this, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. She's getting so hung up on the place that she is missing the fact that the object of her worship is literally standing right in front of her. How many times do we do that? How many times do we walk in on Sunday morning and we're like, going to church, we're going to worship today, it's going to be great. Post it on Facebook, you know, worship him today. But yet, we have not, it is not the thoughts of worship really haven't crossed our minds until we got on the property. We did not wake up this morning and say, you know, I want to spend time with God and, and, and reflect on him, be in his word this morning before I go to church. What? Get in the Bible before I go to church? That's crazy. So that God can reveal his truth to us. Be reflecting in our minds about the greatness of God and his grace so that when we walk in, the attitude's already here, but we walk in and we kind of expect the like, worship switch to flip. But it doesn't work like that. We're so hung up on the place that we're forgetting the person of our worship. Worship is not about this building. It is not about Sunday morning. It is not about a place, period. Worship is about a person. It is about worshiping God who gave his son. And the beautiful thing is, is that if you're a Christian here today, if you're a Christ follower, a believer in Jesus, you are never without the presence of God with you because his Holy Spirit has moved inside of you. This woman was about to leave the well. She wasn't going to be standing in front of the Messiah forever. Those of us that are believers, we don't have that situation. When we said yes to Jesus, God said yes to us, and he took up residence inside of us. We see this in Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 17. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. You are never without the presence of God if you are a believer. And it is never about a ritual, a practice, or a place. There is an apologist named Ravi Zacharias, and if you are not familiar with him, I recommend you get familiar with this guy. But what he does, he travels around and he, he kind of debates a lot of people from different religions and different belief systems, atheists, agnostics, but Muslims and Buddhists and Hindu, and he debates them from a Christian perspective. And a lot of these people, they, they are all about ritual 
in their religion. The ritual is hugely important. You can't worship without the ritual. But this is what Ravi Zacharias says. He says, There are no unique postures and times and limitations that restrict our access to God. My relationship with God is intimate and personal. The Christian does not go to the temple to worship. Now watch this. This is nuts. The Christian takes the temple with him or her. Jesus lifts us beyond the building and pays the human body the highest compliment by making it his dwelling place, the place where he meets with us. When Jesus gave up his life on the cross and he gave up the spirit, there was a veil, a great curtain in the temple that separated two parts of that building. The holy place where the, where the priests and the people were allowed to go to be able to do the, the sacrificial actions and all the things associated with worship, and then the holiest of holy places behind the curtain. The Bible says this is where the presence of the Spirit of God actually dwelt. There was one person who was allowed to go in there, the high priest, and only at certain times. And if he wasn't completely right with God, if he had unconfessed sin in his life, there was going to be a sudden opening in the high priest's position, all right, because the dude was going to get dragged out of there by the rope tied around his ankle because a holy God cannot be in the presence of an unholy thing. It's just the way it works. But when Jesus gave up his life on the cross, when he paid the ransom on our lives, the temple curtain was torn, torn right in half. Now, can you imagine being in a temple and you know behind that curtain over there is the Spirit of God. And the last time that priest went in there and he wasn't straight, he died. And that thing tears. Can you imagine? Not only would you be like scared, be like, Aah! run away, but it would have huge significance because what just happened? The Spirit of God moved out of a room and he kicked the door down on his way out and he moved into the hearts of his people. So now we don't have to go to the temple to worship. We have God's Spirit with us all of the time. And that Spirit of God in us, it convicts us, it moves us, and it creates in us the attitude of worship so that we're able to actually fully engage with God. Don't miss that. You can be riding down the road in your car, worshiping God. Please keep your hands on the steering wheel. You could be rocking your baby to sleep in the middle of the night, worshiping God. Because if you are a believer, you have his spirit in you, living in you. We have got to recognize that we have his presence in us and that he is no longer separated from us. John Piper, he's a pastor and author and a theologian, and he has a great a great statement that I think really kind of ties this whole thing up. He says this, The fuel of worship is the truth of a gracious, sovereign God. The furnace of worship is your spirit. The heat of worship are the vital affections, our love, respect, and adoration towards God. The fuel of truth in the furnace of your spirit does not automatically produce the heat of worship. There has to be fire, which I think is the Holy Spirit. Just because you recognize the truth of God and just because you are engaging with Him fully with your mind and with your heart, without the Spirit of God working in you and alive in you, there is no heat of worship. You've got to have the fire, the fire of the Holy Ghost. How awesome and amazing is that, that we have the privilege this morning to be able to sit not only in God's presence, but have God's presence sitting inside of us. The actual object of our worship is right here, right now, in us. This is what I want you to do. I'd like for you to just close your eyes for a second. We're going to have a minute here where we can do some introspection. We can look into ourselves for just a second. I want you just to analyze your heart. So I ask you to close your eyes, not to get all weird, but because I want you to be able to focus on just you. I don't want you to focus on anything else that's going on. I don't want you to be focused on what somebody else is doing or something in the room, but just you 
and your heart. I want you to ask yourself this question. What is it that needs to change in my worship? Is it the fact that you need to change your time with God because you can't recognize His truth, because you're not spending time with Him, you're not reading His Word? Does your attitude need to change or do you need to even recognize the fact that you have to have an attitude in order for the action to happen? Do you walk in here on Sunday morning and you're like, come on, Joey, get me worshiping? Or do you walk in the door in an attitude of worship and we're just joining in a song that's already going on, a song in heaven that's been going on and will keep going on throughout eternity? That's what we're doing. Maybe you don't fully engage your heart and your head. Maybe you don't fully engage because you're afraid of what might happen if you get a little emotional when you worship. Or maybe you're afraid of, if you think about it, that it might squash the emotions that God's creating in your heart. Maybe you need to realize that you do not have to be in this place on Sunday morning in order to worship, but that the worship is about the presence of God and that you as a believer have His Spirit in you all the time. Maybe you need to recognize that. Whatever it is in your life, just own it. Just own it this morning and say, God, I want to be what you want me to be. I want to be a true worship, worshiper. I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're going, I can't do any of that stuff because I don't have a relationship with him to begin with. The promise of the spirit of God indwelling you is a promise that is made to believers in Jesus, to people who have been saved. We talked about that veil being torn it tore because Jesus gave up his life on the cross to pay for the ransom that was on our lives. He literally bought us back with his blood. And God has said to us, I will adopt you as my child. You can come and be in my family. All you have to do is say yes to this gift that I'm giving you, to trust Jesus as your Messiah, as your Savior, and to follow him, to put your whole faith in him. That's all it, that God is asking you to do. And maybe you're going, I don't have that spirit active in me that you're talking about. Maybe the reason why is because there's never been a point in your life that you can say, yeah, I did that. I stepped out in faith and I have followed Jesus. He is my Messiah. I have asked him to save me. If that's not happened, there's no way worship can happen for you if we're just singing songs. So this morning, this is what we're going to do. Allie's going to lead us in a song. And as she's singing, I'm going to be down here at the front and we just open up the altar. Maybe you want to come down here as your first step towards true worship this morning and just say, God, here I am. I'm worshiping you. I'm fully in your presence and I'm recognizing all these things about you. Maybe you you have questions about what this means to follow Jesus and you want to get saved this morning. I'm going to be here for these next few moments. I'll be here afterwards and I would love to have a conversation with you about it. There are other people here as well, other servant leaders that would love to have a conversation with you about putting your faith in Jesus. So as Ali leads us, if you would please stand.